questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Hello and welcome to the Q&A show with me, Dale Barefoot, on Revelation TV. And as always, it's brilliant to have you, the viewers, alongside us. And we're live, we're interactive, and we really appreciate and value your texts and your emails with questions and comments pertaining to the exciting subject that we're looking at tonight. I'm going to kick off with a question. Is the world really four and a half billion years old, as the evolutionary scientists would claim, or just 6,000 years old, as the young earth creationists would claim? Now, I'm a Christian who believes that the word of God is the truth. And it's immutable. It's unchanging. And my Bible tells me that we have a young earth. It's the truth as far as I'm concerned. But what kind of evidence is there from the fossil record? Does it substantiate the Bible record and the Bible report or refute it? What about bio clocks? Oh, so many questions. But we have a man in the studio who can answer all of those questions and more. And he's an old friend of many of you. It's John Mackay, the creation guy. He's a geologist, he's a teacher, and he's the director of creation research. So a warm, warm welcome to you, John. Great to have you. You've just flown over from Australia to be with us. Jet lagged out of my brain Jet and lagged. hello to everybody. Great to see you. Now, some of the people watching, maybe you may be new mm -hmm. to them, and I'm sure you're soon going to be a friend as well. But, but could you just share a little bit about your, your background and where you're coming from? OK, come from a non-Christian uh, background. Actually, the question Dell raised about the fossils is one of the ones that God used to uh, get to me. By the time I'd finished university, I, uh, you know, I was programmed with evolution millions of years. But the one thing my textbooks kept on telling me in geology was that the fossil record was basically the worst part of evolution. And by the time I rethought that, OK, if the first fish looks like a fish and the first jellyfish looks like a jellyfish, then there is no evidence for evolution. But alternatively, what that means is jellyfish have produced their own kind. So, A, Dell, I became convinced of creation, not quite after university, a few years later, but I, I began running a group called Creation Science, and I've ended up running all over the world. I'll be here in England for the next two months. Look forward to seeing many of you out there, and you can go to creationresearch.net and find out a lot more about me. Now I'm a Christian and an evangelist, as well as someone who digs up fossils, takes people on field trips, and debates like we'll be doing over here on this trip. So it was an intellectual revelation that actually led you to Christ. Uh, yes, I was actually, a, a second part of that was the fact that I was reading a textbook by an atheist biologist who actually was poking fun at God and poking fun at the Bible, and I became convicted to pick up a copy and see what it said. And his comments, the atheist comments, were the stupidest ones I've ever <laughs> seen. So God multi-pronged, got to John Mackay and saved the creation. The guy. Holy Spirit was certainly yeah, on your right. case, wasn't yeah. he? So, so, so do the, the, does the fossil record and the rocks that you, you're looking at almost on a daily basis, do they actually uh, affirm the Bible, what the Bible says about creation and, and the fact that we have a young earth? What is the evidence that you see that is overwhelmingly in favour of a young earth? OK, two things. I've already mentioned the fact that the fossil record that's supposed to show slow millions of years of evolution didn't show any evolution at all. For years, I put the millions of years bit aside because, well, I hadn't been here on the planet for 40 years, 30 years. Uh, I just didn't understand what it's like to be old or have, have vast ages. But then finally, I began to think about, OK, I've got a big fossil collection, Dell. I've got coelacanths, I've got all sorts of starfishes, I've got fossil leaves, I've got beautiful uh, animals and plants embedded. Question, in the world today, creatures live, they die, they rot. How can they be preserved in the rocks unless the rock formed quickly? You see, to be a fossil, if any of you are aiming to be a fossil out there, you can't just die and fall to the ground and wait to be buried because the dogs will eat you, the rot flies will rot you, etc. What you need to do is to be buried quickly. But that's not enough because the dogs will dig you up. You need to be mm. buried deeply, and that's not enough because the bacteria will still get you. You need to have a sterilised, oxygen-free, deep environment quickly. So, Dell. The rocks don't show vast ages. And you mentioned before we started the program about my work on polystrate trees. 
So viewers, if you go to creationresearch.net, insert that fancy word polystrate tree, you'll find a whole heap, including some of the research we did on my last trip here when I last saw Dell, and you'll see the evidence that layer upon layer formed really quickly. That's right. And some of them have their leaves, some of them have their roots, and uh, they, there's no way that they could possibly have grown through millions of years of strata. Well, I so. actually have one specimen that I collected from a whole layer of them. This is stuff called diatomite tiny little microscopic creatures that the textbooks say take vast ages to even build up a few centimetres a foot or so, right? And uh, I have one with a big leaf standing upright through these diatoms. And you look at the textbook, one ten thousandth of an inch per year, and you say, this leaf is six inches long. Ha hang on, that end of the leaf is the same age as this end of the leaf. Mm. It was buried standing upright. So therefore, that diatom and this diatom, the layers got there at the same time, or the leaf would have fallen over, rotted, disappeared. So again, no evidence of slow formation, no matter how big or how, how small the layers are made of particles of. Now, if a, a Richard Dawkins was sitting here, or a, a, an evolutionary scientist tonight, they would be poo-pooing this, of course, and uh, they would probably say, well, what about radiometric dating? What about carbon dating? Uh, they, you know, to claim that the Earth is just 6,000 years old, it's very clear from our research that it's four and a half billion years old, uh, and what you're saying is crazy. But from what I've read about carbon dating and radiometric dating, it's only accurate to about 70,000 years. Or well, that's if, you, if carbon-14 actually worked, that would be the case. Let me mention two things that might help the viewers out there. Now, remember I said I didn't become a creationist till after I'd finished my university geology studies? I sort of struggled with the whole issue. But one thing I had become doubtful of was radioactive dating. Why? Because in my day, to graduate in geology in Australia, we had to date a rock. You didn't get through unless you proved you could date a rock. And here's this small group, you know, 10 of us in the, in the advanced class. We're all trying to figure out this specimen. The professor had walked in the room, given us 10 bits of the one rock, right, and left us and said, I'll come back in a few hours, get this dated, and then we'll check how you're going. Now, when he came back, all 10 of us had different dates, vastly different dates. And excuse me, professor, either one of us is right or all of us is wrong. Mm. And he said, no, 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 give me your results. So we gave him the results, and then he put them all on a blackboard, drew up a nice big graph and said, see, you're all in the right place. And I thought, this is fudge land, folks. And I wasn't a six-day creationist then. I thought, this, if this is the way you'd run the country with that lack of accuracy, this is pathetic. So I became a doubter in radioactive dating at that point. Later on, I discovered, hang on, God was there, we scientists weren't. God never lies, people do, and I have to put myself sadly in that category, right? People lie, God doesn't. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible about that, and therefore, here's what we need to do. Take off our glasses, get rid of Charles Darwin's mentality and say, given what God said is true, what would happen to carbon-14? And you're not the only person I've asked that to. I asked that to a postgraduate geology group doing their PhDs, and they were shocked. When God made the world, it was very good. No radiation problems. That's right. And there's the clue. You see, high energy radiation comes onto the atmosphere, into the planet, and hits nitrogen, and you get radioactive carbon that way. Dell, sign up to go into a carbon-14 laboratory, and it will tell you and the viewers if they knock on the door, danger, put on your face mask, radioactive carbon is dangerous in your lungs. Not dangerous to your skin, it won't even get through your skin, but it will get inside you and damage your lungs. When God made the world, it was very, very good. good. It was perfect. So Adam yeah. had no fear of radiation. There was no carbon-14. Mm. Probably didn't get on the planet till after Noah's flood. Then basically the sky fell down, the world changed. And after the Noah's flood, do you remember how the Bible says we live shorter and shorter lives? 
It's one result of things like yeah, carbon fourteen. Because Methuselah lived to nine hundred and sixty-seven yeah. years. Sixty-nine. Sixty-nine. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me there. Those two, two years, years two made years a big tax difference. Free. Yeah. And also, by by the time we read about Moses, he'd only he only had a lifespan of one hundred and twenty years. So something yeah. pretty radical yeah. was happening in the meantime. And you're not going to make it to one hundred and twenty. I'm not going to make it to one hundred and twenty, but I'm going to do my best anyway. What about natural clocks, John? What about mm -hmm. natural clocks? Because evolutionary scientists put a lot of store in in these clocks, and they claim that the world is very ancient. Uh, and one of the things in their uh, research is that limestone stalactites in caves and stalagmites, they form incredibly slowly, maybe growing just 10 centimetres in a thousand years. Now, radiometric data has shown, according to my, my reading, uh, it, 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 uh, that some of them are 190,000 years in the making. Mm -hmm. So tell us, John, about your experiments. Tell us mm -hmm. about your latest research, which I find really exciting. Um, that disproves that. Okay, well, what we're going to do, folks, is bring up some slides in a moment, and if I can coordinate this with my, my voiceover, etc., we're going to tell you about uh, an experiment we've got going at Jurassic Ark, because ages ago, I began to put two and two together. My father had a tank which was sort of fixed up with concrete. The tank leaked, it grew stalactites. I do a geology degree. They tell me it takes vast ages. Now we do an experiment at Jurassic Ark in Australia. And again, you can see our website, creationresearch.net. And what you're looking at is not a giraffe's drinking trough. OK, that's our first ever stalactite maker. Let's have the next slide. Yep, are we coordinating here? Next slide. Are they listening? Yes, there it is. And what we've done is got half a concrete pipe and we've got cement in there. We've got seashells and we've got leaves. You say, why the leaves? Well, I visited a cave in Western Australia and where the stalactites were growing is where the rainforest used to be. Lots of mulch. Next slide, please. Yeah, they'll get there. Don't worry about it. The mulch has got a real purpose. There's a good cross section. And uh, Del, you're probably wondering how much money we make out of selling static type making machines. <laughs> They're not exactly a high object on the market at the moment, but you can see the top layer of leaves, the plant mulch, then a layer of cement, not concrete, just cement, and then seashells under it. And see the thing at the bottom, stalactite formation? Let's have the next slide as we explain to you what's really going on here. What I suspected was that it was the mulch that was causing stalactites, whether in the caves or in our object here. Um, this stalactite began growing on October the 1st, 2015, right? So when we took this picture, it was only a couple of months old. Uh, yes, it's a stalactite beyond a shadow of a doubt. And as you watch, next slide please, you're going to see some interesting things about stalactites. There's a close-up. You can actually see the crystals at the bottom because the close-up photography shows the crystals beginning to grow down. What's going on? Well, my suspicion was that the stalactites were not growing just because of the lime dissolving and re-precipitating out as CO2 busted off, because every chemist, including me as a geologist, will tell you that's an unbelievably slow process. But these stalactites, the ones on my dad's tank, the ones in the caves, were growing really fast. So next slide, please. And what you find is you too can visit the tourist caves and see stalactites growing off the electric light wires. Next slide. Come on out there. Are we going to change? There we are. And, and of course, the sceptics will say, oh, your stalactites growing from concrete are not made of limestone. Simple test, one you learn in high school. You can prove it's calcium carbonate by putting some hydrochloric acid. You know, the stuff that bricklayers wash the concrete off? Well, it also works on limestone. And see the froth coming out? Calcium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid gives bubbles of CO2. As one chemistry prof that I sent this to said beyond a shadow of a doubt, you've just proved this is limestone. So next slide, please. My thesis became, OK, it's not just the water, it's the bacteria coming from the mulch that are actually on the edge of this thing and they're actually taking the lime solution and using it and turning it into calcium carbonate. Oh, you see there's dates there? This picture I just took before I left Australia. The one on the left we took about a month and a bit ago. You can see the difference. My thumb's up in the top right-hand corner. We have that stalactite growing at one centimetre just over a month. 
not the centimetre in 100 years, <laughs> uh, not the half an inch in 100 years, to put it in modern uh, uh, old-fashioned English terminology, which we don't use in Australia anymore. But what we've done is prove that the idea that these things take such a long time, Dell, and you can remove the slides now and come mm. back to us live, is simply false. So the markers that are used in schools, in textbooks, as evidence of long processes are wrong and lies. Viewers, this is an incredible revelation. This is amazing uh, cutting edge research that John is doing. Viewers, we would really like your questions. We would really like your comments and your views on this. So please email and text. And uh, the, uh, the information is, uh, is coming up on the screen right now. Um, but two facts that I just read, um, John. There's a curtain of stalactites in the Lincoln Memorial uh, on the foundation ceiling in Washington, D.C. Now, it was built in 1923, and those stalactites are five foot long. Yes. Now, that's in less than 100 years, and that just shouldn't be possible, should Well, it? given what you've just seen, it's half an inch in one yeah. month, do the maths, a half an inch a month, six inches a year, 100 years, 50 feet. What a chicken little stalactite you've got in that building. And also, we were talking before the program about the Carlsbad um, yeah. Uh, right. caves out in New Mexico and out there they've discovered a bat uh, perfectly formed that's obviously died but it's died and it's fallen into a stalagmite and it hasn't been eaten by a predator it hasn't been destroyed by bacteria or disintegrated in any way what uh, you know absolutely mind-blowing evidence it isn't is. it for for them forming quickly in a young earth it certainly is and folks if you want to follow up on that if you go to creationresearch.net, you can have a review of a DVD called Time's Up Darwin. And Time's Up Darwin, we filmed quite a bit of it here in England, including some of your limestone formation that's forming as you watch. Not over millions of years, but as you watch. And we took you to a cave in Kentucky in which someone had actually sat down, taken their handkerchief out, put it on the rock, and now it's a petrified handkerchief. Not millions of years. Again, the key issue is not time. That's the devil's lie. It's the evolutionist falsehood. Not time, but process. That brings us back to creation. If you think you need time, no, you need a process by an intelligent creator. That will achieve things, because otherwise, here's what time does. You're getting old, Del. You're falling apart. You haven't got time you know? to evolve because you're going to be dead before you get enough time. So it's not time, but process. And yes. that's what folks need to watch for. Yeah. yeah. Now, my Bible, I believe it's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, John. I, I, I really do. And I, be I believe Genesis 6 mm -hmm. speaks about a worldwide flood. What does your research show in terms of evidence that this was not just a localised event, not just something that happened in the Middle East that many, many people are proclaiming these days, but actually this was genuinely right across the globe? Have you got any um, evidence that can confirm that, irrefutable evidence? OK. Now, folks, you may remember we put up a, a phrase, Jurassic Ark, before. It's the Outdoor Creation Museum we run in Australia. And one of the things it's designed to do is deal with not just creation, but right up to Noah's flood. And we have lots of fossils that we put there, but they're from what are called Jurassic rocks around the globe. It's one, one region we've specialised in. You've got Jurassic rocks here. They've got them in Germany. And we took some of these just last weekend at Easter in Australia. On the Monday, there's a thing called the Easter Fest in Australia at the Redlands area. And we have a fossil tent. And we had a Jurassic bird from Germany. You know that famous one called Archaeopteryx? And we put questions out for people to answer and they could either wait to the end and find the answer or they get a cheat sheet and walk them through the fossils. But as I said to people, how do you know this bird in the Jurassic rocks drowned? And the answer was simple. Its neck is bent backwards, its tail is bent up. And what do we discover, folks, is people, reptiles, animals, birds, when they're going to drown, the last thing they do is go, ah! you do it too. And if you're buried quickly after that, then that whole very tense movement is actually captured. So in Germany, Archaeopteryx. But then you look over here and you go down on the south coast and you've got trees buried with sea creatures. OK, what are trees doing buried with sea creatures? And it's in the Jurassic rocks. You come to Australia, we have massive, massive, and I mean bigger than England deposits, right, <laughs> of Jurassic trees buried by the gazillion. 
in a, <coughs> excuse me, in a flood deposit. So there's evidence all over the planet, even if you look in an individual bed or in multiple beds. So again, folks, if you want to find out more about Jurassic Ark or that DVD, Darwin on the Rocks, or Time's Up Darwin, go to creationresearch.net and we'll tell you more about some of the new ones coming out shortly. Fantastic. You know, I, I've read recently about dinosaurs, that, that red blood cells and haemoglobin have been found in unfossilized dinosaurs. How can they lay in, in strata for something like 65 million years and, and still be in such brilliant condition, still be so fresh? What's going on there? Well, two things you have to remember. One is um, maybe they're not 65 million years old. <laughs> Secondly, you've got evidence there that it was removed from any oxygen or bacterial activity really quickly. Now, perhaps to illustrate it from one fossil I dug up that shocked a lot of university students, here we are in what's the next layer up above the Triassic, just at the base of it, and I'm digging out a fossil fern. Beautiful. Then I noticed one thing. It wasn't just the imprint. It wasn't just the carbon black impression. I actually could pull the leaf out. And you could look through it, and the cells were still there, intact. Now, for those of you who like watching crime shows, you know, they've got a body, they found it in the swamp, they want to know how long it's been there. Simple. What you do is actually look around the edges because if the flies have found it, it's been dead a day or two, there'll be eggs. But if it's longer than that, the little worms will have hatched and dug holes, the bacteria will have started to eat along the edge. But here was this leaf, not a single fray in the edge. So therefore, you knew it had not only been buried quickly, it had been buried um, you know, in the absence of all these other things, and the scale is again huge. So you have something like Noah's Flood, and you ask me about dinosaurs. Folks, next time you go over to Canada, where they have a nice museum full of dinosaurs in the rocks that they dug them out of, you will notice in the British Museum, they usually just sort of build them up as skeletons. Fine, that's nice, but have a look at them when they're found in the rocks. The land dinosaurs are all doing, ah! They were drowned, right? And that's one reason they're, they're pickled. They're so well preserved, you can dig the DNA out. So are we, am I right in thinking that the majority of fossils that you are finding of, of creatures, whether they're sea creatures or land creatures, that they're, not, that they're in a, actually in a perfect state? They're not in a, di a state of disintegration? Well, what you find is they're in, first of all, what I call an activity state. So one of my favourite fossils is a batch that I got from just outside of a place called Lightning Ridge. Do you know what else is found there? Opals, beautiful opals, right? And here is this lovely starfish crawling over a batch of closed clamshells. So we know the starfish was alive because he's still nice and flexible. In Australia, we have lots of starfishes living. When they die, they go, ah! and they're stiff as a board and they fall apart. We know the clams are alive because when they're alive, they're shut. When they die, they open up and they fall apart. So we know it was buried in an activity state. Now that's how you find many fossils, a huge number, too many to be coincidental from just living, dying, falling to the bottom yeah. and disintegrating. Mm -hmm. Now, even the ones that are torn apart, you can actually tell they were buried quickly. Not that they've been preserved whole, but the fact is the edges and the tears have not been tackled by bacteria or worms. Did you catch that? You can tell even it's been torn apart because the edges are still bacteria invasion free. Viewers, what do you think of this? Maybe you're an evolutionist and you're jumping up and down and the steam coming out of your ears and you want to ask a whole batch of questions or you're a creationist and you want some answers. So please email in. This is your opportunity. We're, we're live. We're interactive. And if you've just come in from work, then uh, just send us in your, your query or your comment because we'd love to read it out on air and for John to answer your question. We're getting some in, John. Uh, one from, um, from Steve from Cumbria. He says, hi, guys. Can John tell me where did sand come from? Did God create sand in creation week or was it formed later? Thanks. OK, interesting question and a really good one, because one of the things we know about much sand is it's composed of, you know, that nice quartzy stuff. You, you don't mind it on your feet walking along the beach, etc. But as I like to point out, when the sand gets glued together and turns into sandstone, sandstone, sand that's turned to stone, right? A, you've got to ask, 
how long did it take? And we have one beach we love to take people to because the lime is leaching out of the shells, gluing the sand together overnight, right? So it doesn't take time, it takes a process. And secondly, when you ask, where does that sand come from? We know. I mean, we are living in a world today in which I can register my sapphire or my diamond ring and get it a chemical fingerprint. So that if you really? steal it and try to hock it, we know it's my ring, right? Because it's got a, a chemical fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for sand and the minerals that are in it. So on the east coast of Australia, now I can't claim to know everything about English beaches. In fact, do you have any real beaches? Oh, beautiful oh, yeah, beaches. That's we good. Do. We that's do. good. In Australia, we have famous...